Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is nuclear pursuers, the countries that have stopped short of developing a bomb. When we're thinking about countries along the nuclear path, we usually divide them into one of three different types. There are countries that are exploring nuclear weapons, countries that are pursuing nuclear weapons, and countries that possess nuclear weapons. So far, we've been mostly focusing on countries that possess nuclear weapons and actually have the ability to use them. These other two categories are divided in the following way. Countries that explore nuclear weapons are checking feasibility, investigating how expensive a weapon might be and how long it would take. Whereas nuclear pursuit is an active effort toward acquiring nuclear weapons. So you can see how this is a spectrum that ranges from not on the list not developing nuclear weapons at all, to checking on nuclear weapons, to trying to develop nuclear weapons, to actually having nuclear weapons. We'll be talking about pursuit in this lecture, and next time we'll focus on countries that have explored nuclear weapons. Our first country is Yugoslavia, which had two stints of pursuit. Yugoslavia's main motivation was rivalry with the Soviet Union. That may be surprising given that both of the countries were communist. However, much like what was happening with China, there was a split between the two. In fact, Tito and Stalin really did not get along. As a result, Yugoslavia's pursuit was designed to establish the country as a strong and independent geopolitical power. Still, it didn't turn out well. Yugoslavia ended its program due to a lack of available funding, slow progress toward a bomb, and internal divisions. On that last point, remember that Yugoslavia was a federation of republics, and not all of the republics agreed on the pursuit of nuclear weapons. Indeed, as time would progress, those sorts of internal divisions would boil over, and the country would eventually split apart in the 90s. Despite the slow progress toward a bomb, Yugoslavia did acquire highly enriched uranium. And that highly enriched uranium stayed around for a long time. The program ended in 1987. And Serbia, one of those countries that became an independent nation in the 1990s when Yugoslavia split apart, held on to that highly enriched uranium and didn't actually relinquish it until all the way two decades later in 2010. Here we have a photo of the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, securing those materials and shipping them out of the country. The IAEA is the chief international organization that is responsible for the monitoring and accounting of nuclear materials. So we'll see them doing similar things later on in this course. Our second pursuer is South Korea. The underlying problem here was South Korea's rivalry with the North. When South Korea began exploring nuclear weapons, it had the thoughts of the civil war that split the country in the first place in mind. And even by 1970, those thoughts were still relatively fresh. But what actually triggered South Korea to switch from exploring to pursuing was something that the United States did. In 1969, President Nixon announced the Guam Doctrine, which is sometimes called the Nixon Doctrine. Under this idea, the United States' allies were primarily responsible for their own security, with the United States acting as a secondary support. This troubled South Korea, and South Korea's response was, okay, but if you're going to have us be responsible for our own security, well, that might mean that we develop our own nuclear deterrent. And so what we saw in the years after that is the United States slowly backing down from this announced position of the Guam Doctrine. Two things in particular were key. The United States began reaffirming its security commitments to South Korea, which includes many bases, one of which, actually in the demilitarized zone, has a golf course. The other thing that the United States was doing was providing economic aid. And one of those forms of economic aid came with the assistance in nuclear power. The United States helped South Korea develop nuclear power plants, which are very important for having lots of energy to keep the South Korean economy running. This is going to be a recurring theme that we'll see as we progress through this course. 
where one country receives nuclear power assistance as a means to try to convince the country not to develop nuclear weapons. We'll also see some issues that come along with that. Our third pursuer is Libya, which had a long but unsuccessful program. With Libya, we're starting to see a shift in what is motivating these countries to develop weapons. In the beginning of the nuclear era, it was all about geopolitical supremacy. But beginning with Libya and coming all the way to North Korea today, we start seeing some shifts where smaller countries with personalistic dictators are trying to develop nuclear weapons. And this is less about geopolitical supremacy and more about maintaining regime security. In the Libyan case, we had a poorly run program. And eventually, Libya began to rely on the AQ Khan network to make progress. AQ Khan, you'll remember, was the father of the Pakistani bomb. And when he was done with that program, he created a black market. Libya was one of his customers. But by the time 2003 rolls around, two important things happen that cause Libya to end its program. First, one of the AQ Khan shipments is intercepted, and Libya is seeing a hard time making progress without that shipment. The second issue requires a little bit more context. In 2003, the United States invaded Iraq, at least in part predicated on the idea that Iraq might be pursuing nuclear weapons. Libya sees this, realizes what is now known as the Bush Doctrine is coming into effect, and is worried that it may be next. And so to try to forestall invasion, Libya divests of its nuclear materials, puts them in boxes and sends them over to Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. This is one of the United States' main facilities dating all the way back to the Manhattan Project and continues to be an important one today. With this comes a bunch of pomp and circumstance. So here we have a Libyan official meeting and signing an agreement with the IAEA. On the right, we have Mohammed al who was the director of the IAEA at the time. And for him, this is a really big moment. A lot of his tenure is dedicated toward trying to unravel the AQ Khan network. And this was a central piece of unraveling that. However, if we're thinking about what happens next, Libya does give up nuclear weapons, but within 10 years, there's a civil war that goes on in Libya. The United States provides support to the rebels, and that helps overthrow and ultimately kill Gaddafi. And this is an underlying concern as we think about why countries are continuing to pursue nuclear weapons today. They see what is known as the Libya model, where if a country gives up weapons, they may not actually be secure later on. And so that might motivate countries to try to keep their nuclear weapons programs if they don't think that they're going to be facing preventive action in the meantime. Our fourth pursuer is Brazil. Brazil's motivation was regional power rivalry with Argentina. In the late 1970s and into the 1980s, there was uncertainty about whether Argentina and Brazil would compete for political supremacy within South America or begin working together to improve their economies and joint prosperity. Well, fortunately, they chose the latter. And Brazil's program ended when the countries agreed to form a bilateral civilian oversight agency. And here we have a picture of the initial agreement being signed. On the right, we have the two presidents. On the left, we have Hans Blix, who was the director of the IAEA at the time. That name might sound familiar to you because Hans Blix would later go on to become the chief weapons inspector in the lead up to the Iraq war. The agreement was signed on a border town between the two countries. It's really beautiful there. You can see these amazing waterfalls and would eventually lead to more and more agreements and the culmination of what is now known as the Brazilian Argentine Agency for Accounting and Control of Nuclear Materials or more succinctly abbreviated, the ABACC. Argentina and Brazil have tried to fundamentally integrate their civilian programs, and this is by design. When they do that, the intention here is to become more familiar with what their scientists are up to, so they have some level of trust that these countries are not secretly trying to develop an offensive nuclear capability. 
And that again is going to be a theme that's going to recur as we go on through this course. The fifth pursuer is a rock, and this one's a bit of a roller coaster. Iraq began its program as a way to coerce Iran and Israel. If you look at that first date of pursuit, 1981, this is in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war. Saddam Hussein is thinking of nuclear weapons here as a means of perhaps winning that war. However, both Iran and Israel are aware of a nuclear reactor that Saddam Hussein has long-term plans to use for the development of nuclear weapons. Thus, during the standard course of the Iran-Iraq war, Iran tries a bombing run. It doesn't actually work. However, Israel tries on its own shortly thereafter, in an independent mission, and is successful in destroying the reactor. This results in a long-term pause in actual progress on developing a nuclear weapon. And in the meantime, something very interesting happens. The United States was initially assisting Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War. You'll remember that the Iranian Revolution happened shortly beforehand. And so as a result, the United States is seeing Saddam Hussein as the enemy of his enemy. However, in the intervening years after the Iran-Iraq War, Saddam Hussein begins engaging in policies the United States is not a particular fan of. And so what little continued pursuit of nuclear weapons Iraq engages in now becomes turned toward the United States and trying to be able to have some sort of deterrent force against the U.S. This all comes apart in 1991 when the United States invades and faces very little resistance. However, it's not the true end of the Iraqi nuclear arc. It is the case that Iraq's serious pursuit of nuclear weapons ends here. The deal is so constraining to end the Iraq war that Saddam Hussein doesn't really have a viable path toward nuclear weapons. However, he's not particularly transparent about it. Keep in mind that Saddam Hussein is still concerned about what Iran is doing and would like to have some sort of military power to coerce Iran. So he's not transparent in the lack of progress and pursuit of a nuclear weapon. And it's those continuing fears within the United States that Saddam may be doing just those sorts of activities that is one of the motivations of the second Iraq war, which leads to Saddam Hussein's capture and the true end of the Iraqi nuclear arc. Our sixth country is Iran, and this one is also a bit of a roller coaster. Iran began pursuing nuclear weapons in 1989 as a way to coerce Iraq. But like Iraq's program, Iran eventually turned its focus toward the United States. To give you a better background, let's go back in time. Iran began exploring nuclear weapons under the Shah. When the Iranian Revolution begins, much of the nuclear scientific know-how leaves the country. And so, as the post-revolution Iran is fighting the Iran-Iraq War, Iran can't make too much progress toward the development of a nuclear weapon. Iran, of course, eventually reaches a stalemate in that war and starts trying to develop a nuclear weapon on its own. But before it actually develops one, something very important happens. The United States invades Iraq and this time removes Saddam Hussein from power. Thus, Iraq is no longer a threat to Iran. However, this puts the United States on Iran's doorstep and that causes concerns within the country and continued pursuit of nuclear weapons. The next major moment in the Iranian program occurred in 2015. This was the year that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was signed, or what you may know of as the Iran Deal. The United States, Iran, and a group of international partners agreed on the following terms. The United States would give economic concessions and promised warmer relations overall with Iran if Iran would open up its program and stop pursuing nuclear weapons. To be clear, the Iranian government has had a consistent public position that it has never had interest in the development of nuclear weapons, and everything that it was doing with its nuclear program was for advancement in the civilian realm. As a result, researchers have a hard time coding this. 
You may recall, in fact, when I put up the dates of Iran's program, I had it as 1989 to question mark. This is ongoing, so it's really hard to say what's happening. By many accounts, Iran did, in fact, pause its pursuit of nuclear weapons following the agreement. However, the way things stand today, it's unclear where this is going. The Trump administration has pulled back from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And as a result, it's not obvious what Iran may do next. The final pursuer is Syria, and there's not too much to talk about here. Syria had a small program from 2002 to 2007, ostensibly worried about coercion involving Israel and the United States. However, what little progress Syria made was destroyed by Israel in a 2007 strike on a secret reactor. And thinking about what happens in more recent years, Syria has been so distracted by the Syrian civil war that there's really no progress to be made on a nuclear weapon when it's so busy trying to fight and win that conflict. That actually wraps up our discussion of pursuers. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time when we talk about nuclear weapons explorers. Take care.